So my name is Oz. I work at the University of Florida. Um, I'm a veterinary pathologist and a uh, virologist. So serpentoviruses, which is now, they've been renamed, so everything that we've been calling NIDO for all these years are actually serpentoviruses, but you can still call them NIDO. Um, it's the same thing. These fall right into my wheelhouse of interest and expertise. Um, and so the lecture I'm going to give today is kind of um, an introduction to serpentoviruses or nidoviruses. A lot of you may have already seen some of this. I'm going to show a lot of pictures. Some of the pictures are a little bit gross, um, but I think it really does demonstrate what these viruses can do to your snakes and why they're so important. Um, so I'm going to talk, uh, start off actually talking about the disease history um, because I've been studying these viruses um, for almost about 12 years now. So I was working on these viruses before we knew what virus they were. So I'll kind of give you an introduction to how um, there were a couple of groups working on these viruses. Jim down here at University of Florida, Dr. Jacobson, and then um, a group up in the Northeast. So when I was back up in New York, we were working on a different collection that characterizes viruses. So I'll talk about that at first. Uh, we'll talk about some of the features and considerations of these diseases in your snakes. And then I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of how this disease looks and what it's doing um, so that you can really understand how important it is. Then we're going to step into a little bit of ancillary diagnostics, not talk too much about that, um, but kind of give you an idea of what you can do, be doing for testing, testing options. And then in the end, kind of talk about investigative directions, where we're going with this research, and at which point I'll transfer it over to Steve. And he'll talk a lot about um, what we've kind of been doing in the lab and then recently um, what some of your funds from last year went towards. Um, and there's a lot of people that really go into all of the information that I'm going to be presenting here. Again, I've been working on these viruses for over 12 years, um, and there have been a lot of people involved in this in different parts. Um, so people back up in New York, we have great collaborators at Colorado State University, a great team of people here now working at the University of Florida. Um, we've been working with a lot of um, state and federal agencies now, doing a little bit of work into what viruses these may roll the viruses, the role these viruses may play in invasive pythons um, and any native species. Um, and then also what's really important and what you guys need to realize is how essential the money that you're donating is for this type of research. Uh, so the work that I was doing up at Cornell, really everything came of that from a collection owner up there that was, you know, financially pretty well, um, was able to give us a $20,000 check to start to do this research. And we would not be anywhere near where we are now um, if it were not for that donation. Um, and then the money that you guys provide, it's really hard to get funding for science in general. And when you say that you're working on a virus that really only affects snakes, there aren't that many people that are that interested. So for us really to make progress and do this type of work, having contributions from all of you to fund the re reagents and everything that we need to do to do this research is essential. So we're gonna start off talking about disease history. Um, and so back in about 2007, 2008, um, there was a large collection of mixed snakes up in New York, predominantly ball pythons, um, but a handful of other species, Morelia, um, there were some reticulated pythons, Burmese pythons, um, just kind of a, a hodgepodge, some BCIs. Um, but they had snakes uh, tip, you know, housed in large racks, um, and they were starting to see pretty significant respiratory disease present in their anteresian pythons as well as in their ball pythons. And so just a little bit, you know, uh, large, large freedom breeder system, um, tubs, some glass plexi front cages. Um, and this is, can you guys see this? Is it dark enough? All right, so this is, this is what the snakes were initially presenting to us with. So what this, this is the mouth of a ball python. We've cut right here, right at the edge of the mandible and reflect it back. So here's the tongue and here's the glottis and the trachea right there. And then this is where the coina should be. And what we see is a lot of that yellow, just kind of nasty junk in there. Um, and the rest of the oral mucosa is kind of red. Am I blocking this for you guys mm -hmm. back there? Come on. It's all good. <laughs> How about that? Is that better? Yeah, thank you. You're wrong. Um, so reddened, roughened, um, and this is very typical of what we see snakes with stomatitis. Um, and if you've been working with pythons, working with ball pythons, you know, there was, stomatitis has been a problem in ball pythons for forever. That's kind of one of the disease manifestations in ball pythons is stomatitis. So, you know, initially there wasn't as much exciting. They were just like, ah, it's just some bacterial stomatitis. We have this in the background all the time. Um, 
But the other thing that was unique about a lot of the snakes that we're presenting is they had this really abundant mucoid, inflammatory debris coming out of their mouth. So this is one of the snakes with necropsy, obviously its head's been cut off. Um, and so that is all just inflammatory cells and mucus inside the mouth of the snake. And so this is the outside of an affected snake lung. So snake lungs should be nice and light pink. They should not be dark red. They should not look this wet and they should not have little white dots throughout them. So this is a lung that is very inflamed, this is a lung that is very edematous, um, and this is a lung that is not working very well. If you go and open that lung up, the inside of the lung contains more of that dis disgusting mucus, and these yellow white areas are plugs of inflammatory debris that are filling up the holes <coughs> where gas exchange is supposed to happen. So this is a lung that isn't working. And these snakes were open mouth breathing, struggling to breathe, and all of that mucus that I showed you in the oral cavity was in the trachea too. So you guys have seen a snake trachea, it's not that big to begin with, and so they're fighting against moving air against the trachea, all that mucus in the trachea, and then when the air does get down into the lung, there are blood vessels all throughout here where oxygen is supposed to move in and between the red blood cells in the vessels and the air, and it's blocked with all this mucus and inflammatory cells another lung opened up that is just massive amounts of mucus and inflammatory cells so these snakes are really they're suffocating in the amount of inflammation in their lungs um, this is not I mean these snakes this is nothing of what a bacterial stomatitis does in a snake so we knew we were dealing with something that was very different um, after looking at a few snakes and we knew that there was a bacterial component of this but really looking at the lesion and the way it looks under a microscope, this looked much more consistent with a virus. And there are a handful of viruses we know or knew at that time that cause respiratory disease in snakes. Paramyxoviruses are a big group, rheoviruses are another group. And at that time, we were sending samples of this lung down to Jim's lab here at University of Florida to test for those viruses that we knew about and they were coming up negative. Um, and that's kind of when the, the disease hunting side, which is what I spend most of my time doing, gets much more challenging is trying to find the things that you don't know that already exist. And at that time, next generation sequencing, which now is, is really readily, readily available and not as expensive, was not done as commonly and was extremely expensive. So we were kind of in a holding position for a number of years. Um, and so just, this is histology. So this is if you take a really thin section of lung and put it on a microscope slide and stain it. This is what normal lungs should look like. And the important thing to notice is that these spaces here and those reddish structures, those are all red blood cells and these are the blood vessels. For the lung to work, the red blood cells need to be immediately adjacent to an airway where the oxygen is. But the second that you start making things farther away from the lumen, which is what's happening here, and all of this inflammation in here, the lung doesn't work as well. So this is what we see on a microscope slide. And this is very, I, I've spent a lot of years looking at things like this. When I see this, I immediately think virus. And I know that you won't appreciate that. But this is what a viral infected lung looks like. The lesions weren't localized just to the lungs, however. So here is normal trachea. Here's affected trachea. So massive inflammation and changes in the epithelium lining it. See all these cilia up here, those little structures? That's important for moving mucus in and out. It's gone here. So not only do these snakes have abundant amounts of mucus in their trachea, they can't move it normally either. Here's the esophagus, and this is the esophagus of a nido ball python. So massively inflamed and distorted. So we, after a couple of years of collecting some of these snakes and, and doing the necropsies, we were able to collaborate with a group at Columbia University, uh, Ian Lipkin's lab. And they were doing next generation sequencing and they took our samples and lo and behold, we were right. There was a virus in there and it was a very different virus. I and mean, at the time we knew that it was just related to a couple of viruses most closely to this, this group of fish viruses. Um, and so that's, that's where we kind of identified ball python nidovirus. I mentioned to you before that um, it's hard to get money from people for doing snake things. It was also hard to publish this because <laughs> the guy really didn't care all that much about this snake virus that he had found and we were trying to get it out in the literature and he would not respond to emails for months. It was close to a year um, until a paper came out that described a related virus in an Indian python. 
And so this was just one snake that had this virus and pneumonia. Um, but the second that this paper came out, that's when the scientists that did the sequencing for us got actually interested um, and then said, okay, we need to publish this right now. And then the paper was pushed out in short fashion. Um, and so that's the paper here where we described the ball python nidovirus in ball pythons. At the same time, there was another group of scientists, including Dr. Wellahan, Elliot Jacobson here at University of Florida, and then others at uh, University of California, San Francisco, um, who were doing this, were also keyed in on the fact that ball pythons had respiratory disease and there was a virus in them. Um, and they published this paper um, very shortly after this. So we had, in a very short amount of time, three scientific publications describing this whole different group of viruses affecting snakes. But you guys are, I mean, it's carpet fest. You know that it's not just ball pythons. So the Morelia paper came out in uh, a couple years later, although the syndrome in green trees and carpets had been present for a period of time. Um, and then there's a number of papers that came after. Uh, 2018 with Colorado State, we were able to take isolated virus, give it to ball pythons and reproduce disease. So that's really important because that shows that the virus we found just wasn't an accident. It's actually what causes disease. So if you take a healthy ball python and give it ball python nidovirus isolated just in the oral cavity, that snake will develop clinical disease within a number of weeks. And so we were able to do that. Um, and Steve's gonna talk a little bit about this a little bit. One of the major things that limits us in doing reptile virus research is there's not a lot of reptile cell lines. Um, so at the time when we were doing this work, there was essentially just a heart cell line from a viper. And that's all we had to grow things. And viruses don't always like to grow on cells that are not closely related to what they normally infect. So it wasn't until I was able to establish a cell line from a diamond python that we were able to actually grow the virus. So these are healthy diamond python cells, and then these are diamond python cells infected with virus, and you can see they're small, these bright white blebs. Those are dead cells because of the viral infection. And so yet we use that virus to infect uh, ball pythons with uh, Laura and Hanks and Mark Stengline at Colorado State, again, recapitulating the disease. So, what does nidovirus or serpentivirus look like in the pythons? Um, and you guys may or may not have seen this, hopefully you have not, but if you have, the initial presentation is usually the presence of abundant excess mucus, open mouth breathing, labored breathing. So here's a ball python, you can see all that clear mucoid material right next to the trachea. Here's a blood python, you can see all of that just kind of snotty stuff around the nose. So they're producing copious oral secretions. Um, we know that, you know, I think at this point it is safe to say um, most pythons are susceptible to these viruses. And, you know, what's in the literature is far behind what we actually know and the samples that we get at the University of Florida, the samples that Fish Head gets. If you have pythons, they are going to be susceptible to one of these viruses. And we're not just talking about one virus, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we do also know that it's not just pythons. Other boids can be infected with these viruses and they can have clinical disease. Outside of that, we're really starting to, we're really trying to understand, talk about colubrids, other reptiles, what these viruses that can infect the pythons can do in those other species. There have been related viruses described in shingleback skinks in Australia, as well as Bellinger River snapping turtles. So we know that related viruses can infect other reptiles. Whether you're the viruses that are in a collection of pythons, you may have disease, whether they are susceptible to those viruses or studies that we're hoping to do this summer, at least to get started. Um, but this is a large paper that includes we did samples towards this study. This is a large longitudinal cross-sectional sampling of serpentivirus. Um, and we'll show a phylogenetic tree of that in a second. Um, but this is just from our lab at UF um, and then the uh, literature. These are all the different python species that serpentiviruses have been um, characterized in. So, I mean, and again, this is not a complete list. There are more pythons that I just necropsied a, a bread lie yesterday. It's NIDO positive. It's, you know, so if you have a python, they're susceptible to serpentivirus, most likely. We've also found serpentiviruses in a number of boa species. So again, it's not pythons only. 
And uh, we have started to pick up some of these viruses in colubrids. So this is not an all-inclusive list. We don't yet know the disease potential of colubrid uh, serpentaviruses, um, but we hope to have more info on that in the future. These ones that are still shown in blue, these are species where we've detected serpentovirus and they have clinical signs. So we can detect animals that don't have clinical signs, but most of the species we detected in, you can have clinical individuals. And so this is a phylogenetic tree, and what that lets you do is look at the relatedness of different viruses to each other. And this is very complicated to understand, but essentially what this is showing through a very small piece of the genome is we're not just dealing with one virus, we're not dealing with two viruses. There's a wide variety of viruses out there. And we don't understand what virus A may do in species A versus what it can do in species B. And if there's virus B, what it can do in species A and what it can do in species B. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And honestly, it's really important because we know that there are some serpentoviruses that we can detect that don't cause any clinical disease at all. I mean, do you mind if I mention your Kenyans? So Steve has uh, Kenyan sand boas. We've detected NIDO in them in screening. None of them have ever presented with a hint of respiratory signs, right? Yeah. No. So just because you have a serpento positive animal does not mean it's a death knell for your collection. Um, so I started in the hobby before I became a veterinarian, so I know kind of the stigma of disease. Um, and then, but on the veterinary side of things, disease happens. It's not your fault. If you have a disease in your collection, you didn't do anything wrong. I mean, farmers deal with this all the time. They have cows, we know they have disease, it's how you deal with it. Um, and that's really important for you to understand is it's not that it's bad that you have a disease, it's recognizing if you have a disease, how to deal with those animals, how to isolate them. Ideally, if there is a treatment, which we don't have for these viruses now, but there are ways to manage virus-positive snakes that are non-clinical that can keep the rest of your animals safe. And so it's really important to talk with a veterinarian or talk with someone on how to do that. And there's simple, easy things you can do. Just because you have a serpentovirus animal doesn't mean you have to euthanize it. If it's a really sick serpentovirus animal, that's a different story. So, and again, the names for these viruses are a little confusing. We often name a virus for the first species it's been found in. Ball python nidovirus was first described in ball pythons, but that doesn't mean that's the only species it can infect. These are all the species that we have detected ball python nidovirus in. So these are python viruses that can cause disease in a wide range of species. So the pathologic features, again, I kind of introduced that to you. So um, this is the lung of a ball python with ball python nidovirus uncomplicated by a secondary bacterial infection. So you guys, are, if you've dealt with this disease, you may have had animals that had respiratory signs, you put them on antibiotics, they would get a little bit better, wax and wane with respiratory signs, you stop treating with antibiotics, and the disease comes back. That's because the virus alone, in the absence of any bacterial infection, still causes significant changes to the lung. So this lung tissue is thickened, and look at all that mucus inside the trachea. So antibacterials, antimicrobials are only going to get the bacteria, they're not going to do anything to this virus. This is the lung of a green tree python with NIDO infection. You can see it's very reddened. There's, it's very wet looking, and again, it's a little bit cloudy because there's inflammatory cells in there. This is what normal snake lung should look like, and what you can make out here, the important take home message is, you see pink, and you see white, and you see very little blue. And this is what it looks like close up. This is a nidovirus lung. Do you see how blue it looks? That's all inflammation, and that is all epithelial proliferation, and that's all decreasing the function of the lung. So all of this blue you see against that, that is all bad. Again, blue is bad. It's proliferation and inflammation. So this is also a little bit for those, the veterinarians that you're working with, this is the lung of a snake with a NIDO infection. We need to do this, we need to do closer studies, but in our initial in experimental infections, I truly believe that the lung is one of the last tissues to be affected by the nidovirus, and it's actually starting in the oral cavity, the nose, and the trachea. And if you catch really early infections, they're gonna be just upper respiratory. So if you have an animal that is NIDO positive, you suspect it's clinically diseased, if you just have your veterinarian send in lung for histology, the diagnosis may be mixed. You need to look at the tissues of the head. So again, NIDO-positive animals don't have to have lung changes. So this is the nose, 
of a healthy snake. This is the nose of an infected snake. So massive inflammation and necrosis. This is the respiratory epithelium of the nose that's not working anymore. This is Jacobson's organ. It's also very inflamed. So these animals can't smell the way they're supposed to. That may be contributing to why some of them go off feed. NIDO positive animals also demonstrate a change in breeding. It may be because of the affecting of the olfactory system. This is all the inflammation in the trachea. So trachea is really severely affected. This is the oral cavity. Again, they're, producing, they're presenting with massive inflammation of the mouth. All of these blue dots are inflammatory cells. They're not supposed to be there. So this is my favorite. Whenever I'm looking at NIDO snakes on necropsy, my favorite sample to look at is this is the opening of the trachea. The glottis is there. This is the snake's tongue. So that shot you have. So here is looking inside the snake's mouth. I cut the tissue right here. And I put it on a slide and I look at it. And that for me is the diagnostic section for serpentovirus or nidovirus infection. This is a normal snake, a healthy snake. This is an infected snake. Look at the difference. Again, look for the blue on the pink. Look how much, that is all inflammation and proliferation of that epithelium. And that when you start doing that in your esophagus, your lungs, your trachea, your nose, you have an incredibly sick animal. This is the roof of the mouth. Again, lots of inflammation and necrosis, lots of inflammation. Here's the trachea. Look at the difference. This is the thickness it should be. This is what it turns into. Okay, so ancillary diagnostics. PCR is really, really useful for detecting uh, NIDO infections. And you really want to get a swab of the oral cavity. So you want to try and get a swab up in the cholena and then back it around, right around the glottis and the base of the esophagus. That is a very diagnostic sample. Um, collect the swab, try and keep it cold. Either ship it on ice packs, you can freeze it if you need to. RNA viruses are very sensitive to um, breakdown of their genome. Their genome is, is extremely sensitive, so the longer you keep samples cold, the better. This is a technique that's called in-situ hybridization. And what this does is this lets me look for the actual viral genome in the tissue. And it stains the virus genome red. So this is this section. Remember that section I showed you through the tongue? Through the tongue and the glottis? This is that same section right here. See that massive amount of red down there? That's that mucus. It is loaded with virus. All of that stuff that they are secreting is absolutely loaded with viral genome. And if you look on the surface of the mucosa, all that red, those are all the virus positive cells. So just taking a swab and swabbing around that area is really the highest um, chance of you detecting a virus positive snake. So there it is. All of those epithelial cells are massively loaded with virus. I mean, this is a nasty infection. There's, this is producing tons of virus. This is the lung. You should, red is virus. That is how much virus is in the lungs of these snakes. All that mucus in between the air spaces, they are just absolutely loaded. And then here's more of that mucus, and then again, some of the pulmonary epithelial cells. But the pulmonary cells don't seem to actually produce as much virus, or not many of them is infected. So that's why I think the lung is actually a later stage change. This is the lumen of the intestine. No epithelial, nothing in the intestine actually gets infected. This is the swallowed spit and mucus. So they are passing virus in their feces. It's not because they're infecting their intestinal tract, but because of all that stuff they're swallowing, they are able to pass it through their GI tract. So treat fecal material as being virus positive sample if you have a, a clinical snake. So this is just to kind of give you an idea. You guys know about these viruses now. It's, it's not so much that there are a lot more of them out there. You know about them, we're testing more animals. But this is the historical trend from the year that these viruses were first described to currently as to how many samples were submitted to our lab for viral testing. So one in 2014, one in 2015, kind of, you know, a couple dozen, 2016, 2017, 2018, we almost had 200. This year, we're almost near 800. And there's a couple of large research projects going on in here, but there's a lot of samples coming in. This is, people know about this, this is a really, really prevalent virus out there in collections. And so if we look, these are the numbers of samples versus the number of positives. So handful of positives, 
2018, we had almost 200 samples, but 62 of them were positive. Of that, 40 of them were ball python nidovirus, but we had at least 10 other suspect viruses in that group. And then 2019, of the 800, about 200 swabs were positive for NIDO. Only about 12 were positive for ball python NIDO, but then we had a massive variety of other viruses. It's really important to remember that not all PCR tests are created equal. And I'm not going to advertise for any one place or another. The people that are in this room that are doing the testing, they can talk to you about their tests, they can tell you what their controls are, they can tell you what's going on. There are a number of veterinary labs that will offer rock bottom pricing on diagnostic tests and you can't get any info out of them after a test result. They can offer a test for $25 or $35 only because they're not running appropriate controls and you're not going to have someone that you can actually talk to about your test results. So again, I'm not saying who to submit to, I'm just saying the, the real key of working with a good laboratory is that you can call them on the phone and talk to them about your test results and what it means for your collection. Um, because the people that are here, we can do that. And then, so the last, investigative directions. There's a lot we don't know about these viruses. Um, host range susceptibility, so those are some, I actually just finished writing a, a small grant today to fund a vet student to help us work on this over the summer. Um, we want to see, I have a large panel of reptile cell lines. I've got a lot of snake cell lines, I've got turtle cell lines, I've got crocodilian cell lines and lizard cell lines. Can we take the virus and infect cells in the lab? And if we can, that may be some of the first evidence to suggest that, hey, other species other than snakes are susceptible to these. And for those of you that have mixed collections, maybe you should keep that in mind. How stable are these viruses? I mean, these are some of the essential questions you guys need to know. If a, you have a virus positive snake and it's got mucus all over the inside of its enclosure, how long is that mucus gonna sit there and still be infected to another snake? What disinfectants can you use? And so that's really, that's one of the critical questions that we, Steve's going to talk about. We've made some really good progress in the assay that we can start to answer these questions. How do these viruses grow? Are there other diseases that make this infection worse? We do know that mycoplasma, which is an important bacterium, has a high association with serpentovirus infections. So how much of this is virus alone? How much of this is bacteria? We need to try and figure out where did these viruses come from? You know, where, have they always been out there and we've just missed them? Has it been just, it took the right collection where snake A was able to transmit this virus to snake B and from there it kind of grew out? We don't know yet. We also can't answer the question of disease progression. Not all snakes that are infected are gonna present with clinical signs and not all snakes that are infected are gonna present with clinical signs at the same rate. And you know that as, I mean, this is an essential question during quarantine. What, if you bring a new snake in your collection, how long do you need to keep it in quarantine? You know, a lot of people are in two, four weeks. I mean, honestly, to be safe, reptile quarantine should be at least six months. And you're much safer if you're looking at a year. And that's really hard to do if you have, you're limited on space. I mean, if you're trying to maintain a small collection, where are you going to keep another snake for a year? Um, and so I do understand the logistics of it. I'm not just in my ivory tower sort of thing, but ultimately it, it's the, the questions that you need to know to keep your collections healthy. All right, I think what we're, we're gonna take some questions at the end. Steve, if you wanna go, I'll queue up your presentation. All right, so um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about kind of where the proceeds from last year went and sort of the status on, on a lot of that and also to kind of put in context the, the timeline on which some of these things operate. Um, so to investigate really any of these uh, experimental avenues that we want to take, um, a lot of them need a uh, reptile cell line for the virus to grow on in the first place. So the problem is there's very few commercially available reptile cell lines, uh, period, and uh, up until uh, the work of Dr. Oz and uh, Tracy Logan. Um, there was really only one snake line, the, the viper cell, or viper heart cell line. So before any virus work can be done, we need to get these cell lines uh, established. And so just to do a quick overview of how a cell line is, is established. So first thing we need is a snake. And unfortunately, we need that snake to be dead. Um, and then we need that snake to be submitted for necropsy. And once that snake is submitted for necropsy, we take samples of different tissues. We put them in... Uh, plates to, to grow in uh, culture media. 
Most of those are probably not going to end up becoming anything. A lot of times there's uh, ancillary bacterial, just from the fact that it's, it's a you know, living creature that's going to be covered in all sorts of stuff. Um, a lot of times the cells just crash, they don't do great, they go for a couple generations and then crash. So, But occasionally we get lucky and some of them make it and we pass those into uh, flasks and then after a much passages of those we eventually get a characterized cell line. So once we have our characterized cell line um, we're now able to start doing some of these assays. And so one of the first assays we tried to do was a plaque assay. And so the plaque assay is a, is a way to determine the uh, amount of vi viable infectious particles in a given volume. And this allows us to see how those infectious particles uh, change under various circumstances. Like, um, does it go down with sanitizers? How persistent is it in the environment? Stuff like that. So how this assay works, so we have our pretty cell line. Um, it's grown on a layer in the bottom of a, a cell or a, a well, so it's a monolayer. Um, which is represented by this. We put our virus in that media. It attaches to a, sh a cell, makes its way in. Um, and then the other thing we do is we put an agar on top of that. And what that agar does is when that virus grows inside that cell and gets, uh, gets released, it hits that agar and can only go to the cells immediately next to it. And those cells subsequently die, forming a blank spot on the plate where these right white uh, holes are. So I don't know if this has a laser, but yeah. So um, each one of those white spots on that plate uh, would represent an original uh, infectious particle that was in that, that uh, volume. Unfortunately, none of this worked for the nidoviruses. Um, they didn't form these plaques, so we weren't able to, to get this assay up and running in the way that we were really wanting it to be. So that brought us to a different type of assay, which is a little bit more crude, um, but it's the same general concept. It's a TCID-50, a tissue culture infectious dose. Um, and it's very much the same as like a, an LD-50, um, except for we're doing it on, on cells. Uh, can you press play on that? It's a little video actually, just to show what, uh, what it looks like. Should be on the image. Yeah. Yeah, so this is just putting in medium to these plates, but these are 96 wall plates. So each one of those little holes has a cell monolayer at the bottom. And so we're looking for the dilution of virus, which uh, kill either kills or, or has 50% of the cells showing some sign of being infected with virus. Either they kind of like ball up like uh, was in the uh, images in the previous PowerPoint. So, um, so for starters, uh, each two rows is a, is a uh, test run. So the first well would just get pure virus, and then each well gets half the amount of the one prior, and you just kind of go on down the line with that. And so this is an example of what it actually looks like uh, in real life. So um, at the bottom here, this is the control. So this is what the cell should normally be looking like. The first cell is just pure virus, so all the cells are dead. And we're looking for the point at which about half the cells are some, showing some sign of virus. So. This is ball python nidovirus grown on uh, diamond python heart cells. And uh, another example, this is uh, the same virus but grown on amethystine python. And so you can see the cell type's a little bit different. And the uh, place where the, the uh, TCID50 is actually a little bit uh, lower on the amethystine python. So it shows that they're not quite infecting amethystine, amethystine python cells as easily as the uh, diamond python. So, this is just an example of kind of the types of experiments we can do with this. So we can characterize the in vitro host range. So we have three different nidoviruses that we're working with right now, uh, the ball python, green tree python, and antiregion python. And so far I've tried them on diamond python and amethystine python cells, but because of the work of Dr. Oz and uh, Tracy, we have a ton of different reptile cell lines and we can start doing all of these various tests of how all these viruses do with all these other cell lines. And that'll give us some indication about how that might uh, work out in the real world. So with this, we can also work on the environmental stability and the sanitizer effectiveness. So kind of all these other ancillary tests. So th there's a lot we can do with this. Um, yeah. So here's some basic preliminary results with uh, ball python nido and diamond python heart. So this is after two freeze thaws. Uh, and so it didn't really change. 
But after the third freeze thaw, the uh, it required a lot more virus to to infect all those cells. And a fourth freeze thaw, it gets even more extreme. So this is showing that uh, after multiple freeze thaws, the viruses are not very persistent. Um, and again, it just goes to show an example. This we're testing freeze thaw, but you could equally do sanitizers or, or really anything like that. So. Here's some other interesting results just talking about the differences in how each given virus affects a different cell line slightly differently. So this is ball python nido on the diamond python versus amethystine python, and you can see uh, it infects the diamond python a little bit easier. When we compare it to the green tree python nido, we see that same kind of general trend where that green tree python nido did not infect the amethystine python cells very well at all, um, did much better on the diamond python. And we kind of see the same thing with Anteresian python nidovirus. So this gives us some indication that, that some of these viruses might infect uh, certain animals at, at a more efficient rate than, than others. The other thing that we've been using some of the money for is uh, whole genome sequencing. So this is actually the entire genome of a nidovirus. It's 30,000 bases. Most of the uh, diagnostic tests that we're using give us about 130 bases of sequence, which is not a lot. So to get these whole genome sequences, is very ad advantageous. So here's a zoomed up, and so you can see all of those are individual bases in that virus genome. What that allows us to do is to compare the genome between all these different viruses and build a, a more effective phylogenetic tree and give us a better understanding of their evolutionary history. And it also uh, allows us to create new primers for diagnostic testing and uh, to be able to catch the widest amount of viruses. So um, I'll let uh, Susan and uh, Pia talk about some of the stuff that they're doing, but we're also collaborating with uh, Justin Zoolander from Ohio, Ohio, uh, sorry, Utah State um, University, who's planning to use our TCID50 assay uh, to examine the effectiveness of various antivirals. So it's sort of just an offshoot of that, where, where a lot of the work that some of the other people we've been involved with uh, really it came down to, to nailing this assay and, and getting it working right. So um, again, we'll save questions for the roundtable stuff. Um, Susan? You. Sure. Fish Head Diagnostics is to use the data that has been um, provided to us by the community. So people who are submitting animals for testing, um, we collect a whole bunch of data. I don't know if any of you have seen our data sheet, but when you do submit samples to us, we ask a whole host of questions, and that includes, you know, what enclosure type, how old is your animal, has it been exposed to the virus before, things uh, like is it showing clinical signs? So do we see this excess mucus in its mouth or is it having respiratory signs? Um, just to get more information on you know, what we're seeing and how these viruses are affecting different collections. Um, so I have a um, wonderful pathologist from Taiwan who's working with me for the next year and his job is to start using some of this money that you guys have donated to look into the um, prevalence of disease in collections that we're seeing as well as to uh, do a small study to look and see how long the virus is persistent in the environment and we can't do infectivity I'm leaving that to Dr. Oz and uh, the soon to be Dr. Tillis um, <laughs> Uh, to, to look at that in the lab, but you know, we're doing the preliminary studies to look at Can we pick this virus up two weeks out? Um, so what we're doing is taking some uh, Green tree enclosures looking at multiple different temperatures um, And multiple different sampling points to see if we can actually pick up pieces of the virus in the environment um, Over say a two to three week period. So in the next couple of weeks We'll be starting that trial, but until then I figured I'd give you some uh, data on what we've seen And so this is a map uh, that dr. Lee was nice enough to compile for me this week of all the different states that we have tested um, the red indicate positive uh, states where we've seen positive um, and states where we've seen negative results. Now, this is just kind of a visual rep representation of you know how widespread this is around the U.S. and I think everybody kind of knew that already because there's a lot of trade uh, in the hobby and people are going to shows and you know selling snakes to each other and. Um, I think there's, you know, a stigma with this disease, and as Dr. Oz was saying earlier, that, you know, it, it doesn't need to mean that everything needs to be euthanized. It's so prevalent in collections that we're seeing it in 
about 30% of the collections that we're testing. We've tested about 120 collections over the past year. So um, knowing how to manage the disease and understanding what that means for your animal, I think is, is super important when making decisions on euthanasia and um, how to move forward with your collection. So um, that's really what we're doing at Fish Head Diagnostics and we're working closely with the University of Georgia to um, make sure that our assays are as up to date as available. Um, so whenever sequences get published in the literature, we make sure that we are testing our primers against those uh, to be ensure that we are picking up um, all of the different strains that are out there, uh, especially because we're finding new ones every day. That was pretty much all I had. <laughs> Not as formal, sorry. Maybe next year I'll do a formal talk, but <laughs> that, was, that was it. So. If you can open it up to questions. Thank you. Yeah. I think I started with a question for the panel. The obvious one. All right, Tony. So y'all haven't tested yet for disinfectants and how well they work. Is that correct? No, not yet. Um, so, no, not yet. So Steve, uh, Steve was very modest in his discussion. The, we, we, it took us an entire summer trying to get the plaque assay working. Um, theoretically, it should work, but it doesn't work for all viruses. Um, and then, so once Steve's had some time, I mean, it took months. The other thing, everything in reptiles happens slowly, and that includes how fast their cells grow. Um, so it took us some time to actually get the TCID50 working. Um, I would say that we have, we really have just gotten the TCID50 to a point where we trust the results it's giving us in the past probably six weeks or so. So from this point on, we are planning out all of the experiments to start looking at disinfectants across the different viruses. So no, we have not done any of that yet. Um, the hope is that now that we have everything going, we're going to start accumulating a significant amount of data in a reasonably short amount of time. We are going to try and have a veterinary student helping Steve this summer to try and get more results. But you know, it takes it takes time. We don't, you know, we're not just going to try one disinfectant once on one sample of virus. We're going to try it three times and make sure the results are really good. So, unfortunately, things take a lot longer. But the results that we're giving you, we want to make sure are actually true. So, what is your hunch on it? I mean, I I. I think that we can use other coronaviruses as a model, and I think, you know, I, I always just trust bleach until proven otherwise, and I know that bleach is nasty, and it smells, and the fumes, and, um, but it, it works. Um, it's an enveloped virus, so uh, the peroxide-based disinfectant should work reasonably well as also, I know how much the hobby loves F10. I don't have a good guess on F10. We really have to test it and see. Um, but, you know, bleach is, would be my recommendation. Just appropriate concentration. You want 10% bleach. You at least want a 10 minute contact time and then rinse everything profusely to get rid of any residue. Uh, so do you want to just m mention uh, what Justin Julander is going to be working on, or the collaboration there and the yeah. funding? Yeah. So uh, Justin at Utah State, Steve mentioned it a little bit. Um, again, you know, the 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 key to this really is to, was coming up with an assay that could allow us to determine the infectious titer of a virus, because until you can determine the infectious titer of an isolated virus, you can't determine what anything will do to change it. So what he's going to start doing then is take the TCID50 that Stephen has established with different isolated viruses and then start exposing viruses and cells to different antiviral compounds at different dilutions to see if there are any antivirals out there that decrease the infectivity in tissue culture. Now you have to remember that these are all in vitro experiments. If I take an amethystine python cell line and show that it doesn't really get infections. So Steve showed the data that some of those viruses don't infect amethystine python cells as well. That doesn't mean that an amethystine python is more resistant to a suprentovirus infection. There's a lot of things that go into that. The type of cell that we isolate. And everything that happens in a lab doesn't translate perfectly to real life. But Justin's going to start and look at some of those antivirals to see if there are any candidates that can be used for treating sick snakes. What's the likelihood of having false negatives? It really, it depends on, so the, I, the highest chance of false negative testing, and, and I'll let Susan comment on this as well, um, probably has to go with the sample collection. 
um, if you if this swabbing is maybe not as vigorous or if during the period of the swab being collected and then it getting to one of our labs there's a, a heat shock period where you know it's exposed to really high temperatures in Memphis the ice packs aren't frozen you know there's a lot of different things I think sampling is probably the number one chance of false negative the other thing we don't know is that some of these snakes do seem to be intermittent shedders so a snake that's positive, you may swab it week A and it's really low virus that we can't detect with our assay. Three weeks later, it must be higher. So, you know, again, I know it's easy for me to say in a perfect world, quarantine for a reptile should be six months to a year. In a perfect world, if you want to say for absolute certainty that an animal is NIDO negative, it needs three consecutive negative test results at probably two month intervals. So bring an animal in, test it two months in, I, I, honestly, we, because these viruses we think do break in times of stress, the best time to test an animal is probably the second you get it or a week after because that animal has been exposed to stress, whether it be in shipping or in moving to the show or wherever you're getting it. It's a new environment. Test it. And if it's negative, test it two months later and then two months after that. You get three negative test results. I, with some, you, you should have some confidence that that animal is truly negative. One other thing I'd, I'd just add. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing I'd add to that too it, uh, would be that we're not just talking about a virus here, and that that also complicates things quite a bit because you know it's kind of like saying we're looking for a snake here, and and there's differences between different snakes and, and how significant they are if you get chewed on, uh, and and there are. Uh, um, and, and our primers are probably not going to have the same sensitivity for, for all of the different uh, nidovars. I, to, to give you guys an idea of how far up the tree the name nidovirus goes, the, the, the new coronavirus coming out of China, that's a nidovirus. And, and uh, um, there, there, there's, a, there's a wide diversity of, of, of even the ones we see within snakes. And so the, the, that answer is also going to vary uh, for false negatives based on, on which virus we're talking about, because it's not all the same thing. So, so you mentioned about like F10, and I think a lot of people in the hobby, you know, they want to kind of boil down to a hobbyist protocol. And so one of the ones that I, I was talking to Justin Julander about it, and he's talking about in their lab, they spray everything down with alcohol. And so from that, I guess we can extrapolate that hand sanitizers may have an effect. but. For me personally, in my collection, I'd like a little more reassurance because, I mean, there's like dwell time, you know, how long does that have to stay in contact? And hand sanitizers, while that may be effective, you're talking about 10 minutes of bleach and all of these things, well, hand sanitizers just by default are being used to speed things up. They're, they're so that I can quickly hit and go. And I'd love to not just extrapolate that, but have some testing that says, you know, Purell hand sanitizer does it. And that, that would be really cool in your when you get to that and you're going through testing things to to actually write them down to the brands. You know, like that one at the, you know, if you find a hand sanitizer with isopropyl alcohol at 70% and you maybe you could even prove like once didn't do it but twice did, you know, a double shot would do it. I think that would be really cool for people trying to burn through a 50 animal collection. Does F10 and that hand sanitizer, is that a good technique? Or are you not yet? Yeah, I mean, you, depending on how that information comes across, and we don't want to get sued, you can't <laughs> call it. You can just call me. <laughs> uh, uh, one issue, um, and one thing to remember is we are assaying these things on living cells. And so a lot of the things that you may test that may, what, so let's say we use Purell, there's a lot of other things in Purell that may actually just kill the cells by themselves. So we almost, a lot of times we need to isolate these things down to the, the actual thing of the active ingredient in it to see. And pure, one of the things I worry about with Purell is all of those other things that make it an ointment we would have to do appropriate controls and that sort of thing. So liquids are a lot in, a lot easier because of that. We could certainly check 70% alcohol and see what 70% alcohol does to a sample over time. Um, and you know, those are things that we will do going forward. Um, it's just, you know, so the experiments you propose, just to give you an idea, right? So if we want to try Purell for 
10 second shot versus 20 second shot over different viruses on different cell that's probably three or four weeks worth of experiments just for what you've suggested so it's it's kind of a challenge to then look at every single permutation sure. and so you know what we may do is is we get our baseline data and then say all right what's the best recommendation we can make to hobbyists and instead of testing what everyone's doing is saying we've tested this we know it works this is what you can do and give you a couple of common commonly used things uh, to approach it from that viewpoint. Sure. Yeah. What's the vibe? What's the vibe? Why with what you said with quarantine rooms? I mean, you, 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 before you put something in, if you know that it's going to take you a month, if there's anything in there, that there's going to be no zero yeah. chance of infecting something that you're bringing in. But you just, don't want to affect something that you're bringing in when you're trying to keep it infected from getting in. Exactly. <laughs> but remember that science is science is very nitpicky right so we're going to do our experiments at one temperature at one environmental ambient humidity and all you have to take all those factors into you know we may we may be able to say you know down here in florida too weak but if you've got a colder room up there you know up in the northeast or something the virus may be able to persist longer in areas where you're not having a warmed in snakes so Again, there's going to be a little variability, but we're hoping to provide some of that fundamental data to answer some of those questions. But if you have a moist, warm environment, like a lot of the substrates in the enclosures could be, that's, I mean, that is prime place for a virus to just chill for a while, so. And I can add on just really quickly. If you're having, if you're putting a new animal in the same, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're using the same enclosure for, so say you have one animal, you're moving it out of quarantine and you're gonna have to put another animal in there. So one thing we do in the veterinary field is if we, um, we clean the enclosure three times without an animal in there. So you'll clean it completely, wait 24 to 72 hours, clean it again and then wait 24 to 72 hours and then clean it again. So that way you might, you know, you'll get whatever you kind of have like lingering in between. So that's what we do with parvoviruses and stuff um, in, uh, in the veterinary field, so. Well, like I said, for my issue, I'm not uh, just saying take one, take out. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm one of your little more paranoid people. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if there's virus, not just in the enclosure, let's say your whole quarantine room, you know, it's good to know if there's a longevity. Oh, you know, all of a sudden a piece of drool hit on the table, your hand's on the table, you already had everything cleaned. There's always a process of trans transference from one to another. It's not always economical to, stay, to sanitize an entire room. So this way with the longevity, with like he said, okay, it, does, it survives at 60 degrees, but if you crank it up to 80, you might, we might find out that it's dead in a week, or three weeks, or, you know, so that information would help as far as... Uh, yeah, and ho hopefully we will have that information uh, with all the research that we're doing, so, so yeah. Any other questions? Um, obviously in the hobby, there's so many different types of enclosures. I mean, everybody, you know, you got tubs, you got, you know, exoterras, you got PVC enclosures, acrylic <laughs> Is there, has there been anything as far as like what type of material might might not spread as easy as another, or is it just as simple as like having that kind of like it's just it's on there, it doesn't matter if it's on the surface, it's on the surface. Well, I mean, anything general, anything that's porous is going to be worse mm -hmm. because then there are more holes for things. That you, so if you have glass or something that you can wipe down, there's less places for the virus to hide. Um, I guess my, my concern more about enclosures is not so much how long that virus can stay in there, is it's then transmission from enclosure A to enclosure B. And so, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the situations we see um, where it's collections with these viruses causing a major issue, there's two kind of common themes in my observation. One is it's a rack system. And then two is there's not the best biosecurity of feeding or instrument use between enclosure A and enclosure B. So if you've got a large collection and you know, even if you if you're, if you're have feeders and you put them in with snake A um, and this, the feeder is not fed, I mean, a lot of people are then going to try and then feed that feeder to another animal. That is, that is one of the key places where you get easy transmission. And again, I'm not just talking about NIDO. I'm talking about all infectious agents. Like that is, a, that is a practice that, while I understand it's economical, 
it is really putting a collection at risk. Um, same thing with your tongs or whatever. If, if you're going from one place to another, and I think that in, and I don't know if it's just because larger collections are generally on racks anyway, just for the space concerns, or but racks seem to be at a higher risk for these these larger types of things. Um, the other thing is that we we know that the virus is is really prominent in those secretions that are coming out of the snakes. So droplet transmission is possible. If you have a rack system and there's a drop that can go just from the one right next to it, that's less likely to happen in an exoterra or a complete enclosed tank. So th those are the kinds of things I would worry more about. You know, the, the actual type of the material, I mean, again, as long as it's not plywood, I think most of the things that people are using can easily be cleaned and they're not porous to begin with. So, I know fish head uses the stabilizer on their samples, but prior to that, people were freezing the samples and shipping them cold. So that cold adds detectability. It increases the amount, of, the length of time that the virus is detectable. But does it also increase the amount of time that, that virus is infectable? My fear is, you know, you touch something and get it in your rodent freezer, and you know, is that thing basically? Definitely. I mean, is it six months later still infectable? And so, you know, now you've gotten, you didn't wash your hands thoroughly once and you've infected your rodent freezer. Now, of course, I mean, I'm way over the top and that's not going to happen, but I just was curious about that. If you were to get that in a freezer that you then touch and feed everything out of, um, does time stand still and that virus remain infectable for a long period of time in there? So, uh, general in viruses, the way we we store them and keep them is by putting them in the freezer. So, um, Steve has data that shows with freeze thaw cycles we can decrease infectivity, but no, having a sample in the freezer is the best way to maintain that virus over a long period of time. But at uh, what temperature? Like household temperatures, or? Well, so it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Um, the difference, the, I mean, minus twenty or you know what a household temperature freezer, it, the virus is going to be absolutely fine. The benefit of a general household freezer is that they're usually frost free, right? And so frost free freezers go through cycles of warming, cooling, and so that decreases the longevity something can live, but still it's not warming it enough to, to disrupt it. it. It'll last a long time. But you know, that's again, so it's on the outside of your rodent bag. So then you would have to touch that and touch a rodent. I mean, it yes, it could happen. It certainly could happen. In terms of how long do we put it in the freezer right. until it's solid? So once it's, the sample is 100% frozen. Just even a couple hours or a few hours a day. Yeah, well, we put it in a minus 80 freezer, so maybe like four or five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have. Um, so we have started uh, doing some neonatal swabbing, and you know, depending on their exposure to the virus. So, say they were kept in um, an area where. Thank you. <laughs> It's because you refer to the speaker. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, so yeah, depending on if they've been separated from the adults, you know, we're not seeing a lot of positive animals coming from uh, positive samples coming from neonatal, neonatal neonatal animals. But if they're you know have that exposure to it there's always the possibility that they could be positive, right? So if you're housing neonates next to uh, infected animals and um, the biosecurity isn't as you know ideal as it should be, um, they can transmit. And I think testing them if there you know, is a chance of exposure is worthwhile. Um, but you know, the best medicine is preventative medicine, right? Is to make sure that if you do have positive animals or you think you might have positive animals to take these neonates away as quickly as possible and put them in an area where they can't be exposed to it. 
Right, and has, has there ever, have you or has anyone ever tested a, a positive neon? Yes, um, so we, we've... No, 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 that's not under, under a year old, yes, we have positive. <coughs> oh, under a year, under we've had positives, old. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've had as early as like three months. Yeah. How about for the the hash ring that comes out of an egg that's been separated, that's been taken, that's been completely quarantined? Yeah. So so far, those animals have been negative. Um, if they've been taken and quarantined and, and and separated from the adults, so um, you know our numbers. So our, our our N is pretty small at this point. I would say it's probably under 50 animals, and so we need to collect more data to try and really get a hold on how it is affecting neonates. And um, you know, you know, the problem with a lot of this data collection is that we need to have all the environmental factors, and everybody's holding their animals at different, te slightly different temperatures, slightly different humidities, different enclosures, different substrates, um, and so that always complicates how we interpret everything. Yeah. I know last year we discussed with you guys working with, uh, you know, ha actually having um, eggs from positive animals and stuff like that. You were talking about testing it with like UV and stuff like that to see. <laughs> Where has that gone from that? Do you guys have any more information as, as to have you guys had positive tests out of those guys or have they come out clean or? On the, uh, on the neonates that we produced in Correct. 2017, um, all the animals that we still have um, are still negative. And um, yeah, the, what was your question? Like with with those guys have, that, that were actually, you know, came from a positive uh, you know, animal has yeah. where, has anything been contracted with those, or is or is it pretty much? Left yeah, with they're, they're they're all still good. You know, our our NIDA virus positive animals are in that building, and we do uh, our due diligence to not uh, transfer stuff and sterilize between um, all of that. Our chondro collection um, is is pretty small in there because currently our situation is not great to bring in new green tree pythons. Ideally, our, our quarantine setup should be a building that is completely empty. When you get a new head that's easily sterilized with bleach or whatever disinfected completely, okay, no animals in there whatsoever. You get those animals, they come in, you test them right away. Two months in, test them again. Two months in, test them again. Nothing in there, nothing new. If you get anything from anybody else, yet if you're buying something, maybe um, get it from one person all at once and you know don't be so quick to I know how it is there's something online and it's like oh it's the, I gotta get it before somebody else gets it you know and all that stuff so no we've been there before but um, you know keeping them in there as long as you can and testing them okay and then having your like we have a nidovirus and positive building right because you're probably going to come across those and just because they are nidovirus positive doesn't mean it's the end of the world because we have had success in breeding two nido positive animals together, getting negative animals and keeping them negative. Um, how old are they now? Over two years old now, right? So over two years, um, keeping them clean, not adding anything new, and um, you know all that. And then you could have a, a negative building, right? So from the animals that graduate, quarantine that have been isolated, they could go into the building of uh, negative animals, right? you can have your positive animals that may be asymptomatic right because we have a few that have been asymptomatic for the last several years we put them through the ringer different temperature regimens um you know some things that would make condor people cringe down into the 40s <laughs> right like in the winter time like how 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 tough can these animals be we've had chondros that have had nidovirus that have gone into the 50s and 40s there's a supplemental heat with heat panels so it takes the edge off a little bit right but they haven't popped with respiratory problems or any clinical signs, and outwardly, they seem totally healthy. So people would go, oh, that snake, I've had it for years, it's totally healthy, I've never seen an RI, blah, blah, blah. Everybody says that stuff, right? And uh, that animal, you could be pairing with other animals or it could be infecting other things, right? So, um, you know, just because, as a, but you, those animals in there are clinically healthy, but they are positive for nidovirus, and you can breed them. And if you are paying attention to, you know, your testing and, and you're segregating those neonates when they hatch, you're keeping, you know, when you collect the eggs from the positive animals, depending on what things you might want to do to try to, you know, like Oz was saying, the, the, these, uh, the virus in the environment is not super hardy. So 
52 days of incubation, you know, that, that might make it to where that, that virus is not um, infectious or whatnot. I'm not a veterinarian, so I can't comment on all that. These guys can, but, um, you know, there are things that you could do, like UV, you know, sterilization, maybe uh, a light bleach solution, 10% bleach solution, you know, lightly rub the eggs, whatever, or do nothing. We did that with um, that first clutch. We did UV sterilization on one, nothing on, on the other, because there was a mass of 14 eggs, and those are all adhered together, so we put them in an egg box by themselves, UV sterilization, right? And then there was three kicked off to the side, so we're like, we'll put them in a different box, not do anything, okay? When they hatched, out of the 14, all of those hatched, out of the three, two hatched, one was the stillborn. As they started to pip, um, they didn't come out of the eggs, so we separated each one of those eggs into their own little egg box. Um, I deed them so we could get the egg and all the yolk and all that stuff and send it in for analysis. And um, all the eggs tested positive for night of virus, which was pretty discouraging. At and hatch time? What's that? At hatch time, 50 days later? Mm -hmm. well, uh, yes, yes, yes later. correct. Wow, we, 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 we sent the eggs in after they hatched and it was just the shell, right? And, um, and the neonate sent in for necropsy, okay? The neonate was negative. The shells were positive. We were talking about this before. It's maybe it's picking up on these tests, but is it infectious at that point? Again, these guys would be able to answer that better than, than myself. But from our experience and, and what we did with uh, those, those, all the eggs tested positive. The ones that had UV sterilization also tested positive. Okay, and and the ones that we did nothing with did, and all the all the babies were negative. Okay, it's still negative. Uh, a few people in the audience may have some of those neonates that we produce, and they're still negative. Um, I think that uh, early diagnosis is the key, right? Testing, managing it that way. If you're breeding these animals, if you if you're serious about this, do yourself a favor. You know, get a, a extra tough shed or whatever, insulate it, make it to where it's easy to clean, do proper quarantine, um, and if you get like anticipate getting positive animals right because it's going to happen but it doesn't mean you gotta completely destroy those animals because with some of ours we have some very valuable snakes in there that are uh, positive but they they are clinically healthy and can produce healthy animals if you're doing that process right you know a, a quarantine building a negative building and a positive building but if you have positive animals that are healthy you have to have a strict regimen on what you're doing when you're working those buildings and all of that stuff as well. One thing that I want to... I'm sorry. Hey, actually, Carly, can you do me a really okay. huge favor? Those waters, there are for you guys. Yeah, I want a uh, 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 big nose IPA. Big nose IPA out of the cake. If you can go get that, I don't want the water. I <laughs> want Forgive my ignorance. Yeah. This was mentioned on the last night of virus yeah. panel last year. Um, but the UV that you were talking about with the uh, the UV that you were talking about yeah. um, with the eggs, that's completely different than like the UVA and UVB that we provide our anim some of our animals with in hockey, right? Or it, it was exactly the same. It was, was it? an Exoterra um, UV ball. I think it was a 5.0, so it wasn't anything super intense, but it was just a couple minutes, nothing serious, just a test. Okay. But if you could grab me a beer, that would be great. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what, what was the uh, uh, big nose. Okay. Okay. Let me. I'm getting dry now. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I don't mean to be stealing the show, but <clears throat> all right. I can go. Yeah, I was just kind of. I'll go full circle. I'm talking about uh, st uh, uh, disinfectants and things like that, and how to keep stuff clean. Uh, the contact time is what kills you, right? In, in a big collection, if you have more than 10 animals, 10 minutes, it's not, you know, we have a couple hundred animals. If we were waiting 10 minutes in between each animal, it would take like 10 hours to do like 20 animals. Um, so one of the things that we were, what we do now is we wear latex gloves when we work these things. And also, latex gloves aren't cheap. Uh, you know, and if you're if you're changing gloves in between animals, you're hemorrhaging gloves, especially if you have a lot of animals. 
And after you start working for five seconds with latex gloves, your hands are sweaty and it's a bitch to get those gloves back on. So, like, like Oz said, uh, bleach, like when in doubt, bleach, 10% bleach solution, all of that stuff. We have it mixed up in the bottles. We do it every day um, because if you know, past 24 hours, the effectiveness after it's mixed up, blah, blah, blah. These guys can answer that better. Uh, but we'll wear those gloves and instead of changing out gloves every time, we'll, you're not going to your, spray your hands with bleach every single time, but we'll spray our hands that have the gloves on them when we're doing that, right? So we're spraying that with bleach and letting that sit while you're going through and doing stuff. If you spot clean, don't spot clean with spot cleaners or your little scoops and stuff. Just throw those in the garbage. They're worthless. Carly, you're awesome. Everybody give it up for Carly. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're running long on time. Do we have any more questions? Are you guys enjoying me talking? All right. Woo. Okay, so we're going to keep going for a second. So just... Just two things. So thing one, to make the glove, after having sampling hundreds and thousands of snakes and tortoises, yeah. buy a box of nitrile gloves and just put one pair of nitrile gloves on first and then take your latex on and off because then your hands aren't sweaty and you're only wasting ah. one bottom pair, but it'll save you tons of time. The other thing is, so Cody mentioned detecting the virus on the eggs. Um, when we do PCR, we're just looking for the genome. It doesn't mean it's a viable virus. So that's like if you're hunting deer, just because you found bones doesn't mean there's something to shoot. And that's essentially what PCR is doing. We are just that's that is why yes, just doing PCR-based assays to yeah. If that was that easy, we could have been doing these things a long time ago, doing PCR-based assays. But that's an entirely different question than in an infectious assay, which is what you need the cells and everything for. So just. If you, if you try to do some of those on your own, that's great, but just know that if you detect a virus, it doesn't mean it's actually an infectious virus. I just want to finish up here on just a couple husbandry things. If anybody has questions, I'll, you could talk to me later because I'll go all night. Um, so with forceps stuff, right, like you're, you're handing things off, depending, especially with chondros, I mean, anybody who keeps chondros knows they're going to, you can line that, that thing up perfectly with the prey item. And it's going to swing around side, grab those metal tongs or whatever, and wrap them up, and it's just horrible. Um, and now if they've got any of that uh, you know, stuff in their mouth, it's on there, and you, you want to make sure that you're disinfecting your tools, 10-minute contact time at a minimum, how are you going to do that? I know it's ex probably a little pricey, but it may be worth it, and we've been thinking about how, how we can do this in a several a hundred animal collection. But buy multiple pairs of forceps, right? Let's let's just say thirty pairs of forceps. If you guys are spending ten, you know, thousands of dollars on the animals, buy some damn forceps and buy a few of them. PVC, get your PVC, get a, a cap, and, you know, whatever to keep stuff in there. Put everything in a five-gallon bucket or whatever it is. Fill it up with your bleach solution and have your pair of forceps at each one of those little PVC things, right? So you could go down the line and feed everything. Let's say you have a couple hundred animals. By the time you're done, like you feed this one, boom, back in the bleach solution. Feed that one back in the bleach solution. You get to your 30, your metaphorical 30 forceps. When you start over, that 10 minute contact time is probably there because those forceps have been in that bleach water. So then you can, you know, you can grab those. And just those little things that might help because if you're just wiping it down or wiping out a trash can, what are you really doing? When you hear 10 minute contact time, it's like if you just wipe out a holding can or whatever it is and you, and you put the animal right in there, it's like, did you get everything or whatever? So if you're doing four step stuff, I think that that's probably um, uh, an easy mode of transmission like Oz was saying about prey items and, and something doesn't eat, you feed it to something else forceps, they bite it, whatever. It just just food for thought, multiple pairs of forceps, ways to keep it. You know, like when you go get your hair cut or something like that, they have the scissors and the things, whatever. What about investing in a UV sterilizer? I can't speak on that. I have no clue. Um, does anybody... I mean, it, it, again, we need, to, we need to look at, you know, how effective that is in, in terms of decreasing the viral infectivity. Theoretically, it should work well, but again, I, we can't make any concrete recommendations. 
Anyone else have any questions? We're, we're about out of time for this, the panel, but probably have time for one more question. <laughs>